On March 17, 1981, Italy's special anti-corruption police stormed a villa in the quiet Tuscan town of Arezzo. It was the home of local mattress manufacturer, Licio Gelli. The police, the Guardia di Finanza, had come calling because of Gelli's connection to two fugitive bankers, Roberto Calvi and Michele Sindona. All were rumored to be members of a secretive Masonic lodge called Propaganda Due, or P2. They were. Investigators hoped that Gelli's papers might yield information on the whereabouts of the fugitives. They didn't. But police did uncover a membership roster of the Propaganda Due Lodge. The list contained an astounding 962 names. Among them was the Guardia di Finanza's own commander, Orazia Giannini. And that wasn't the only surprise. On the P2 roster were the names of 119 senior military officers, 22 high-ranking police officials, 59 members of parliament, and 30 journalists. In addition, it listed 128 corporate chiefs. One of them was an up-and-coming media mogul named Silvio Berlusconi. Last but not least were the names of the heads of all three of Italy's intelligence agencies. Someone called it a roster of Italy's secret government. Further investigation revealed that the P2 Lodge's real membership was at least 2,400. There even seemed to be a secret lodge inside the secret lodge, two overlapping pyramids with Licio Gelli as the link between them. Obviously, Licio Gelli was much more than the mattress king of Tuscany. He had friends in the highest circles. Most importantly, he was the venerable master of the P2. His brethren called him King Cobra, and he called them his Fratineri, or Black Brothers. That seemed appropriate because P2 was a black or clandestine lodge. P2 members also had another name, Piduisti. This lecture focuses on Gaeli and the Propaganda Due Lodge, but is about more than rogue Freemasons. Gaeli and P2 were linked one way or the other to fascism, secret armies, assassinations, terrorism, coup plots, black magic, money laundering, drug smuggling, the mafia, and the CIA. Some even throw in the murder of a pope. The Lodge's reach extended from Italy to the United States and South America, and it counted among its members men such as Argentine strongman Juan Perón. P2 illustrates the difficulty of trying to determine where one secret society leaves off and another begins, or whether what looks like several different groups are really one, or vice versa. Then there's the usual question of just who, or what, is really in control. Are there puppet masters behind the puppet masters? Hang on, it's going to be a wild ride. The best place to start untangling this web is with the man seemingly at the center of it, Licio Gelli. He was born in 1919 and grew up under Mussolini's fascist regime. He joined the fascist party in around 1938 and served as a black shirt volunteer in the Spanish Civil War. During World War II, Gelli collaborated with the German army and SS while serving in the security service of Mussolini's Italian Social Republic. After the war, Gailey's political sympathies remained pro-fascist. That brought Gailey into contact with men such as Prince Junio Borghese, who was another Mussolini loyalist dubbed the Black Prince by friends and admirers. Gailey and Borghese belonged to a resurrected fascist party, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, or the Italian Social Movement. In 1956, this spun off a small, violent subsect dubbed Ordine Nuovo, or New Order. Gelli and Borghese joined that, too. Among Gelli's fascist comrades was Stefano Delle Chiai. He's credited with inventing something called the strategy of tension. This envisioned using terrorism, especially false flag terrorism, 
to create a state of insecurity and fear, and then exploiting it. By false flag, I mean an action made to look like the work of one side when it was actually committed by another. Delechiae was a close friend of Black Prince Borghese and a fellow member of Ordine Nuovo. In 1916, Delechiae formed yet another secret society out of new order called Avanguardia Nazionale, or National Vanguard. He used it to conduct strong-arm attacks against leftists. So what looked like three groups, the Italian Social Movement, New Order, and National Vanguard, were really all manifestations of one. The Italian Social Movement was a mass political party. New Order, or to give its full name, the study center for the New Order, was a kind of neo-fascist think tank. Delechiae's National Vanguard comprised the street fighters and terrorists. As seemingly separate entities, one couldn't be automatically blamed for the actions of another. That's led to suspicion that the three groups were coordinated at some still higher level. In December 1963, Licio Gelli, now age 44, was initiated into a Masonic lodge in Rome. Like most Italian Freemasons, he came under the jurisdiction of the Italian Grand Orient Lodge. Gailey was sponsored for membership by a man who would soon become Grand Master of the Italian Grand Orient, Lino Salvini. In his day job, Salvini was a politician and a socialist. Gailey, of course, was a fascist, but secret society loyalty apparently trumped political differences. When Salvini became Masonic Grand Master in 1966, he tapped Gailey to revitalize the near-defunct Propaganda Due Lodge. Gailey set about enrolling hundreds of new members into P2, and no ordinary ones. But to understand what's going on, we need a crash course in post-war Italian politics and in the history of Italian Freemasonry. After 1945, fascism and the Italian right lay defeated and discredited, but not dead. Political power rested in the hands of two parties, the right-center Christian Democrats and the far-left communists. Playing third fiddle were the moderate-left Italian socialists. The Christian Democrats were stronger than either of the leftist parties individually, but not if they combined. The communists controlled large parts of Italy and relentlessly pushed for seats in the government. The Christian Democrats and their foreign backers including the CIA, wanted to prevent that at all costs. So the Christian Democrats made the Socialists their junior partners, keeping the Communists at bay. The alliance was unstable, however, and the future unpredictable. The neo-fascists, who pulled maybe 10% of the vote, were no threat at the ballot box, but they could be useful. The fascists hated everyone, but above all, the Communists. So anti-communism created a convergence of interests among the Christian Democrats, socialists, and fascists. That convergence of interests had to be hidden from the public. Arguably, P2 Lodge was a way to do that. The origins of the Propaganda Lodge go back to the 1870s, soon after the establishment of the Unified Kingdom of Italy. The big loser in that unification was Pope Pius IX. He lost almost all of his territories and was reduced to taking an allowance from the new Italian state. Pius IX denied the legitimacy of the Kingdom of Italy and excommunicated anyone who served it, including the king. Pius denounced the Italian state as the spawn of revolution, and he held no group more responsible than the Freemasons. Pius wasn't entirely wrong. Italian Freemasonry was controlled by the Grand Orient Lodge, and going back to the French Revolution, Grand Orient Lodges were linked to revolutionary politics and anti-clericalism. In 1738, Pope Clement XII had issued the first papal decree against Masonry, and so did at least seven popes following. Pius IX himself issued no fewer than six condemnations of the Brotherhood between 1846 in 1873. The real godfather of Italian unification was the same man who was the godfather of Italian Freemasonry, 
Giuseppe Mazzini. Mazzini spent most of his life as a revolutionary conspirator and secret society luminary, starting with the Illuminati-inspired Carbonari in the 1820s. A Republican at heart, Mazzini accepted the Italian monarchy reluctantly. To obscure the role of Masons in Italian politics and shield them from papal or royal persecution, Mazzini proposed the creation of special loggia coperta, that is, covered or clandestine lodges that would enroll Masons who wouldn't openly participate in other lodges. They were called coverta or covert brethren. One such covert lodge was formed around 1876 and named Propaganda Masonica. It was also Propaganda Uno or P1, the forerunner of P2. Mussolini had no use for scheming Freemasons, and he banned the order in 1925. For the next 20 years, Italian Freemasons, like the Communists, eked out an underground existence. In 1947, the new Italian constitution outlawed secret organizations, that is, those that didn't share membership lists with the government. The Propaganda Lodge reconstituted as a regular lodge, but more or less sat on the shelf until Galey took over in the late 1960s. No sooner had Galey gotten the lodge on its feet than he and P2 became involved in a plot to overthrow the government. Again, we need some background. Like France, Germany, and even the United States, Italy in the late 1960s was convulsed by leftist protests and labor unrest. This peaked in the autunno caldo, or hot autumn, of 1969. There were hundreds of strikes. Communist-led workers occupied the giant Fiat factory in Turin. Some feared a red coup or general strike was just around the corner. The fascist militants of Ordine Nuovo and Avanguardia Nazionale saw themselves as the shock troops to stop this. Their plan was to seize power first. So, Black Prince Borghese formed yet another neo-fascist sect, the Fronte Nazionale, or National Front. No surprise, it shared most of its members with Ordine Nuovo and Avanguardia Nazionale, which again suggests they were all, on some level, the same organization. In December 1969, National Front cells conducted a series of bombings. The biggest the Piazza Fontana blast in Milan killed 17 and injured nearly 90. Per the strategy of tension, the explosions were officially blamed on anarchists and communists. A year later, in December 1970, the stage was finally set for a full-blown coup, the so-called Golpe Borghese. Its code name was Tora Tora, an homage to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The armed activists numbered only about a thousand. The question, never answered, was what parts of the Italian military and security services were standing by to help. The chiefs of almost all of those services were members of P2. Borghese and other conspirators later boasted that they also had the secret support of the United States and NATO, especially the CIA station in Rome. The plan was to seize the defense and interior ministries, along with key government officials and the RAI television station. Propaganda Due's venerable master, Licio Gelli, was in the thick of things. He led a team tasked with capturing or killing Italian president Giuseppe Saragat. But something unexpected happened just hours before the coup was to go down. Black Prince Borghese called the whole thing off. Why is another mystery. Borghese later claimed that the government had been tipped off. Maybe. Or maybe he just got cold feet. Or maybe someone higher up, the real architect of the coup, pulled the plug. The Black Prince fled to Franco, Spain. He died suddenly in Cadiz in 1974. The official verdict was a heart attack, but other signs pointed to arsenic poisoning. Either way, Borghese took what he knew to the grave. Licio Gelli also fled to Spain. There he met with exiled Argentine dictator Juan Perón. 
Gelly initiated Perón into P2 and directed Lodge brothers to assist Perón's efforts to return to power. P2 branches were soon established in Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. With or without P2's help, Perón returned as Argentina's leader in 1973. Gailey traveled with him to Buenos Aires. Under Perón's protection, Gailey and P2 took over the Italian embassy in Buenos Aires and turned it into a base of conspiratorial operations. But Perón died in 1974, and Gailey eventually returned home. Italy, in the meantime, had descended into its years of lead. Terrorists, both left and right, tormented the country with bombings and assassinations. The government banned several organizations, including New Order. But like many a secret society before and since, the group simply changed its name. New Order became Ordine Nero, or Black Order, and continued to operate without a hiccup. P2 also came under scrutiny. The Italian Grand Orient decided to distance itself by suspending the Lodge's charter. That didn't happen until 1976 but the suspension was backdated to 74. Still, P2 simply went back to being a black or clandestine lodge outside normal jurisdiction. Gailey continued to lead it. Gailey also formed an alliance with a new Rome crime syndicate, the Banda della Maliana, whose leader became, you guessed it, a P2 member. Italian authorities had more things to worry about than rogue Masonic lodges. One was a shady lawyer turned shadier banker named Michele Sindona. In the 1950s, Sindona started out as a money launderer for the Sicilian Mafia, and later for the Gambino crime family in New York. Dubbed the Shark, Sindona used his earnings to buy control of banks. He also cultivated connections to the Vatican and Pope Paul VI, who just happened to be a relative of the late Prince Borghese. And Michele Sindona was member 501 of the P2 Lodge. Sindona's criminal empire started to unravel in the late 1970s. One problem was the 1978 death of Pope Paul and the ascension of a new pontiff, John Paul I. The new regime in the Vatican made noises about investigating alleged corruption in the Vatican Bank. Those suspicions centered on one of Sindona's and P2's money laundering fronts, the Banco Ambrosiano. The head of Banco Ambrosiano was yet another P2 black brother, Roberto Calvi, who was nicknamed God's Banker. That's because the main shareholder in Ambrosiano was none other than the Vatican Bank. When Ambrosiano failed, the Vatican Bank lost $250 million. Some found it more than curious when the new pope, John Paul, was discovered dead in September 1978, just 33 days into his reign. Again, the official verdict was heart failure. If this sounds familiar, it might be because the story was thinly fictionalized in the film Godfather III. Whatever the truth of John Paul I's death, Sindona's and P2's names were mixed up in other killings. First, in March 1979, came the gangland-style assassination of investigative journalist Carmine Pecarelli. Pecarelli's assassins were linked to the Banda della Maliana and P2's terrorist mastermind, Stefano Della Chiai. Curiously, the murdered journalist was also a member of Propaganda Due. He apparently upset somebody by asking too many questions about the recent kidnapping and murder of ex-Prime Minister Aldo Moro. Moro's abductors and killers were acknowledged to be members of the leftist Red Brigades. But Pecarelli claimed that the Red Brigades were just the pawn of a bigger conspiracy, what he called a lucid superpower. Was he talking about P2 or something else? Regardless, death shut him up. A few months later, mysterious gunmen killed state investigator Giorgio Ambrosello, who'd been digging into Sindona's dealings. Shark Sindona then faked his own kidnapping and vanished for months. No one knew where. 
Sindona was finally arrested in the United States and convicted of fraud in 1980. Four years later, he was extradited to Italy to face murder charges. It was the Sindona investigation that finally led the Guardia di Finanza to Licio Gelli's door and the discovery of the P2 membership list. Once that came out, the Italian Grand Orient again moved to distance itself from the Black Lodge. In 1981, the Grand Orient formally expelled Gelli. And in 1982, the Grand Orient abolished P2. You could almost get the idea they were trying to hide something. Of course, such edicts did nothing to destroy a secret society with hundreds or thousands of members, most of whom remained unidentified. In July 1982, Italian authorities seized a suitcase from Gailey's daughter as she was trying to leave the country. Hidden in a false bottom was a document apparently written by Licio Gailey called Memorandum on the Italian Situation. Written around 1977, the memorandum declared trade unions and communists as P2's main enemies. Communists had to be kept out of the government at any cost. Coincidentally or not, murdered politician Aldo Moro was a conspicuous advocate of compromise with the Reds. This revived suspicions that Gailey and P2 were complicit in his death. The memorandum proclaimed P2 to be the incubator of a new political and economic elite that would replace the rotten Italian Republic. In its place would arise an authoritarian regime disguised behind democratic trappings. A huge war chest of 30 to 40 billion lira, likely provided by Sindona's enterprises, would fund the operation. Control of the media would be key. It was discovered that P2 brother and God's banker, Roberto Calvi, had financed the purchase of one of Italy's most influential newspapers, the Corriere della Sera. In the meantime, Calvi's bank collapsed and he fled to London. And that brings us to yet another murder. On June 18, 1982, Calvi's body was found hanging from London's Blackfriars Bridge, his pockets stuffed with bricks. The initial verdict was suicide. Further investigation showed that to have been impossible. Among other things, Calvi's fingerprints were nowhere on the bricks he presumably put in his clothing. So who killed him? Those familiar with secret societies saw two clues. Bricks are indelibly linked with masonry. And Blackfriars, the bridge from which Calvi was hanged, is the English form of Frattineri, the inner name of the P2 brethren. And the hits just kept coming. Back in Italy, Michele Sindona was convicted of murder in 1986. Rumors swirled that he might spill his guts for a reduced sentence. Shortly after, Sindona was found dying in his cell. Someone had laced his coffee with cyanide. Most pointed fingers at his ex-partners in the Mafia. But P2 had every bit as much to lose if he talked. How did King Cobra Gelli fare amid this debacle? In the wake of the Villa Ray, Gelli first fled to Switzerland. Swiss police arrested him in Geneva in 1982 when he tried to withdraw a large sum of money. Gelli managed to slip Swiss custody and ended up in Chile. There he was welcomed by another dictator, General Augusto Pinochet. Gelli had lots of friends in South America. He also had another villa in Montevideo, Uruguay, where some believe he stashed P2's secret archive, including the full list of members. That might have been what preserved Gelli's life when so many others were losing theirs. In South America, Gelli and P2 might even have been involved in the bizarre desecration of Juan Perón's corpse. Someone entered the Perón family crypt in 1987. It helped that they had a key. And they used an electric knife or saw to remove his hands. The supposed hand nappers demanded an $8 million ransom, but Perón's missing manos have never been seen again. The crime oozes with occult significance. One theory is that Perón's body was desecrated as a symbolic means to reduce his power 
even beyond the grave. Sort of like driving a stake through a vampire's heart. Another explanation, strange as it may seem, is that his hands were taken to be fashioned into a hand of mystery or hand of the master mason. Occult and Masonic expert Manly P. Hall connects the hand of mystery to political power and the establishment of new government. Again, if this sounds familiar, it might be because Dan Brown worked the hand of mystery into his novel, The Lost Symbol. Basically, the hand is described as a magical amulet used to bring success in political intrigue. Now imagine what the Peronists, or P2, might do with that. There had long been rumors that P2 or some of its members dabbled in black magic. Not so odd for a black lodge full of black brothers, including a black prince. Whatever the case, Gelly returned to Switzerland in 1987. He was arrested again and extradited to Italy the next year. This time, the Italian authorities took no chances. Gelli was returned in an armored convoy protected by a hundred sharpshooters. Odds makers took bets that he'd never lived to stand trial. Again, luck or something smiled on him. Gelli was accused of involvement in a host of crimes, including the murders of Aldo Moro and Carmine Pecarelli and a bloody train station bombing in Bologna in 1980 that killed 85 people. Actually, that was the handiwork of P2's resident terrorist, Stefano Della Chiai. About the only thing to stick to Gelli was a 1992 conviction for fraud in connection to the Banco Ambrosiano scandal. That got him an 18-year sentence, later reduced to 12. In 1994, Gelli stood trial again, along with other Piduisti, for alleged conspiracy against the state and espionage. This landed Gelli another 17-year sentence for revealing state secrets. Of course, exactly what those secrets were, no one would say. Amazingly, Gelli was granted house arrest two years later. He was back home in his Tuscan villa. Gelli was even somehow nominated for a Nobel Prize in Literature. But in 1998, ahead of a hearing on his fraud sentence, Gelli again skipped town. He was soon found living on the French Riviera with $2 million in gold stashed in his bathroom. He was again returned to Italy. Italian prosecutors indicted Gelli once more in 2005 for alleged involvement in the 1982 murder of Roberto Calvi, but the case never came to trial. Lack of evidence, it seemed. Licio Gelli finally died in 2015 at the age of 96. The question remains whether Gelli was really the big spider at the center of the P2 web. Did a more secretive lodge lay hidden behind another? There were vague rumors that P2 answered to a super lodge in Monaco. Roberto Calvi's widow had another idea. She accused the Italian politician Giulio Andreotti of being the real master. Gale, she claimed, was just Andreotti's errand boy. A longtime fixture of the Christian Democrat Party and prime minister multiple times, Andreotti was a Freemason and a Knight of Malta. He was also nicknamed Beelzebub and the Black Pope, which sounds like a good fit for P2. There's no proof that Andreotti was a Piduista, but his close friend and deputy certainly was. Andreotti was also accused of masterminding the 1979 murder of journalist Carmine Pecarelli. Surprise, prosecutors could never make the charges stick. One thing Andreotti did fess up to was knowledge of a secret military organization called Gladio. The Italian media exposed this in 1990. Basically, Gladio was a clandestine stay-behind army, complete with secret command structure and hidden arms caches. It was meant to carry out sabotage and guerrilla warfare in the event of a Soviet invasion or communist political takeover. There is strong overlap among Gladio, P2, and the right-wing groups like New Order and National Vanguard. Some insisted that Propaganda Due and the rest were just fronts for Gladio, 
and that Gladio was just part of a European-wide network of secret armies. The latter was certainly true. In Belgium, the secret army was disguised as SDR8, in Portugal as the Agenter Press Syndicate, in France as Plan Bleu, and in Switzerland as P26. In turn, these secret armies were supposedly coordinated by a secret general staff called the Allied Clandestine Committee, buried deep within NATO. Behind this, many argued, was the ultimate spider, the American CIA. Accordingly, Licio Gelli was said to be a CIA asset paid to instigate false flag terrorism, and P2 was his base for doing so. Those charges got a boost in 2000 when the ex-chief of Italian military counterintelligence, General Giandelio Maletti, a P2 member, claimed that he'd collaborated with the CIA in organizing terrorist acts in connections with Gladio. Maletti fled Italy for South Africa in 1981 to avoid, he claimed, being assassinated. Maletti fingered Gelli and P2 as tools of the CIA and Gladio. Naturally, Gelli and the CIA denied any such thing. Was P2 ever really destroyed? Licio Gelli didn't think so. Recall media mogul Silvio Berlusconi, another P2 black brother. In the early 1990s, Italy was rocked by more political and financial scandals that brought down much of the old political establishment. Out of the ruins arose new leaders. One was Berlusconi, who became Italy's prime minister three times between 1994 and 2011, always controversially. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Licio Gelli was an admirer of Berlusconi. In an interview, the old King Cobra praised Berlusconi for making P2's plan a reality. Who was really behind P2? And what was the full scope of its activity? We'll likely never know. And does P2 still exist? Well, what do you think?